having me. Um, hope everyone is enjoying their stay here in Colorado and also um, their stay here at the center. So I'm here to present the effects of water and non-nutritive sweetened beverages on weight loss during a 12-week weight loss treatment program. And just before I start, I would like to mention that the study was fully funded by the American Beverage Association and um, it was just recently published and I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. It's made a big splash in the news um, because it affects everyone's daily decisions and their beverage consumption behavior. So um, to start off, what are non-nutritive sweeteners and why do we care about them? So non-nutritive sweeteners provide the same sweetness as a nutritive sweetener, but essentially zero calories. And the reason they're, they're such a big fuss in the news is that um, previous observational studies have shown a positive association between non-nutritive sweetened beverages and weight gain. And we don't know whether if people are drinking these diet beverages and they're gaining weight because they're drinking diet beverages, or if um, overweight people are more likely to choose a diet beverage option like this person pictured here on the right. <laughs> um, and so a lot of times we look to previous experimental research and there's one study conducted by Deborah Tate in 2012 and this was through the University of North Carolina. And this study had um, participants randomized to three different groups. There's a diet beverage group, a water group, and a <coughs> standard educational weight loss group. And at the end of the six months, the diet beverage group had a greater likelihood of losing 5% of their body weight or more. And that was compared to the standard education group. And this association was not seen with the water group. So there's some uh, research already showing that non-nutritive sweetened beverages do not hinder weight loss efforts. <coughs> so um, we all know that the role of non-nutritive sweeteners in weight loss is controversial. And here's just a few pictures of diet beverages pictured in the media. Um, so one of the purposes of our study was to look at this question. So we wanted to see if we randomized people in a clinical trial to a non nutritive sweetened beverage group and a water group, and they have the same behavioral weight loss program, will their weight loss be the same at the end of 12 weeks? Um, so for to look at this question, we started out screening about 560, or 506 individuals, and of those, 308 were enrolled, assessed, and randomized. And then um, the people randomized for the non nutritive sweetened group are shown in the blue here, and then the water group is shown in the orange. And we had two different sites, a site here at this location, and then another site in, at Temple University in Pennsylvania. And at um, baseline, both groups were the same with their distributions in age, gender, race, ethnicity, weight, BMI, blood pressure. So all of these factors that could play a role in their weight loss, they're all starting out at the same level. Um, I'd also like to mention that study dropouts were 5.8% for the non nutritive sweetened group and 10% for the water. And this was not um, statistically significantly different between the groups. So a dropout was essentially the same. So our study was designed as a one-year equivalent randomized clinical trial with a 12-week weight loss phase and a nine-month weight maintenance phase. And today I'm just presenting on the 12-week weight loss phase results. Are um, you going to present on the weight maintenance at some point? Yeah, we're actually working on, um, I'm currently doing the data entry for that. So okay. <laughs> soon, that'll, or hopefully we'll get that published soon. And um, I would like to mention that our subjects were recruited from a population of overweight and obese men and women <coughs> who reported consuming non nutritive sweetened beverages at least three days of a week. So that's very important. These people coming into the study already consume diet beverages. And then th these people were randomly assigned to either a non nutritive sweetened beverage group or a water group. So everyone took part of Colorado Way, which is a comprehensive cognitive behavioral weight loss program and they attended 12 weekly 60-minute group sessions and those were taught either by a dietitian or a clinical psychologist and each person was given an individual energy target which was based on their resting metabolic rate rounded to the nearest 100 kilocalories and our physical activity goal for the participants started out by we wanted them to increase their regular activity by 10 minutes a day with an end goal of 60 minutes a day six days a week and then 
the non-nutritive sweetened beverage group, they were required to drink 24 ounces of a non-nutritive sweetened beverage per day. And their water consumption... Was that the limit? Or? That, was, um, that was the requirement for the study protocol. So that was the limit, 24 ounces a day. And their water consumption was not restricted. They could drink more than that. They just had to drink at least right. 24. Oh, at least. Right, at least 24. So oh, they could okay. drink more. Um, and what qualified as a non nutritive sweetened beverage was if it was less than five kilocalories per eight ounce serving and it had a non nutritive sweetener in it. So, like um, your life water here qualified, diet sodas, propel, um, all of those. And then our water group had to drink at least 24 ounces of water per day and they were not allowed to have a non nutritive sweetened beverage. So, if they wanted to have like a sugar free, um, creamer in their coffee, they weren't allowed to do that. It's really interesting that the um, NS and NS folk were allowed to have water. I, I didn't realize that in the initial Yeah, meeting. yeah, so, so they could that, drink water. Could that possibly affect outcome, though? Um, it, it could, okay. and that's not something we looked at. Okay. Well, but the hypothesis from the other studies was that there's something about diet beverages that subverts your appetite control mechanism that will make you eat more sweet things elsewhere right. and gain weight. Right. So we picked people that were already drinking diet soda because a lot of people don't drink diet soda because they don't like the taste. So we wanted to ensure that the people getting the treatment actually took the treatment. You know, but whether you drank more or less water going above that, we don't know what effect that might have. Were the people who were um, drinking water, were they allowed to have sweetened beverages? Like if they wanted to switch yeah. to a regular Coke? Yeah, yeah they could have a regular soda. Yeah, but um, no. No, no, Colorado Way, first step is don't take any caloric beverages. So in the behavioral treatment, that's one of the things we teach them right away, is get rid of caloric beverages. So it's unlikely any of them were drinking caloric beverages. But again, what we find is most of these people aren't drinking calorie beverages anyway. That's the reason they were drinking non-nutritive. So uh, yes, they, they, in the behavioral treatment, both groups, we're told not to drink regular calorie containing liquids. But if, but if there's no restriction on how many or how much they can drink, you know, the equivalent of at least two cans of diet, you know, soda a day, for mm -hmm. instance, how do you measure what, what um, the impact of uh, the difference between if I have 10 cans? of Diet Coke as opposed to two or one. Yeah, so know. that's something we didn't necessarily look at and it's a potential for the next study. Okay. But the um, one thing I'd like to say is that we know that these participants consumed at least 24 ounces okay. of a diet beverage a day. Okay. And Great. so from that, we could look at the effects of their weight loss because we okay. know they're at least consuming that. Okay. So. There's nothing in the observational studies that led to all of this that looked at dose and said you have to drink at least five cans a day before you start gain weight. So it was really to test the basic notion that you drink this stuff, it's going to make you crave other things and you're going to eat a whole bunch of extra food and you're going to gain weight. Okay. Right, right, right. So that's how it was really designed. Yeah, uh, d d your explanation that you, that you got that, you know, that they drank at least mm -hmm. two, that they, that, okay, I thought that, that you told them drink at least two. Yeah. Not that they had already. Been no, that's drinking. something we so looked at for Let's keep it so. moving. <laughs> like we're okay. okay, so <laughs> for our results. <laughs> um, this table is looking at the metabolic and hunger changes, and it's a little busy, so I'm going to walk you through it real quickly. On the left-hand column, we have our outcome variable in our group. So we have, we're looking at cholesterol, LDL, and hunger. And then across the top row, we have our baseline measurement, our week 12 measurement, the change from baseline to week 12, and the p-value for that change. And the p-value is considered statistically significant if it was less than 0 0.05, and all of the p-values in bold on this table were significant. So taking a close, closer look at cholesterol, um, the non nutritive sweetened group and the water group significantly reduced their cholesterol levels from baseline to week 12. However, the non nutritive sweetened group had a greater reduction in their cholesterol compared to the water. Um, the same uh, relationship occurred with LDL. Both groups significantly reduced their LDL levels, and the non nutritive sweetened group had a significantly reduced LDL levels from baseline to week 12 compared to the water group. Now, for hunger, we asked participants, How hungry did you feel over the past week? And they had to provide an answer on a scale of 1 to 100. <coughs> One being not hungry and 100 being very hungry. And the non-nutritive sweetened group started out at about a score of 52 
and their score reduced to about 48. The water group started out about 48 and increased to almost 52, 51. So at the end of the 12 weeks, the non nutritive sweetened group had a significantly greater reduction in their hunger levels, but we cannot say that these scores or the differences in the score is um, clinically meaningful. Can I ask a question <laughs> on these scores? Are those means or averages? These are all averages. And mean and average, that's the same. Um, have you written anything about the difference that it made in cholesterol yet? Um, that was published in the study that okay. they were significantly uh, reduced compared to the water group. Okay. So this is looking at the absolute weight loss from baseline to week 12. And this is, in this analysis, we use an intent to treat analysis, which means that everyone who started the study uh, was included in the analysis regardless of whether they dropped out or not. So for those individuals that dropped out, we use their baseline weight as their baseline weight and as their week 12 weight. So it looks like they didn't, their weight changed, their weight didn't change at all, which makes this analysis very conservative and um, mimics the clinical setting. So, because we're assuming that people who stay in the study are more successful with their weight loss. Um, so the non nutritive sweetened group is shown in blue and the water in orange. And as you can see, the non nutritive sweetened group started out an, at an average of 207 pounds and they reduced about 13 pounds by 13 pounds. And then the water group started out about an average of 206, and then they lost about an average of nine pounds. That's a four pound difference with the non nutritive sweetened group showing a greater reduction in their weight um, from baseline to week 12 compared to the water group. And this was um, statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. How many people did you have drop out? So back to the previous slide, we had 5.8% in the non nutrition group dropout, and then I think about 10% in the water. That's right, you did say that, I'm sorry. Yep. And that wasn't statistically different between the two groups. And then this analysis is looking at the same thing, absolute weight loss, but this is only those who completed the study. So for only those people that we have a baseline measurement and a week 12, um, and the same thing happened. So the non nutritive sweetened group lost an average of 14 pounds. The water group lost an average of 10 pounds, again, a four pound difference, with the non nutritive sweetened group showing a greater reduction in their weight from baseline week 12. So um, this figure is looking at the percent of participants who achieved at least 5% weight loss. And losing 5% weight loss is a significant um, as a can show that you have significant health improvement. So it can reduce your risk for heart disease, it can lower your um, risk for high blood pressure, as well as lower your risk for type 2 diabetes. So it's a, a great clinical outcome measure that we can look at in the study. And the non nutritive sweetened beverage group is shown in blue, and 64.3% of those individuals lost 5% of their original body weight, whereas in the water group, only 43% lost percent of their original body weight and again this is this difference was statistically significant so what do these results mean and why did the non nutrient sweetened group have a greater weight loss and unfortunately we are unable to determine the underlying mechanism and some people might say well what about differences in hunger um, the non nutrient sweetened group had a greater reduction in their hunger and like I said before this um, difference may not be clinically meaningful um, and may not contribute to the greater weight loss. Um, and then what about difference in, differences in physical activity? So this is something we measured with an armband, so it was uh, objective data, and both groups significantly improved their physical activity levels from baseline to week 12, and there were no differences between the groups and their activity levels at the end. And then cholesterol, um, the non nutritive sweetened group showed a greater reduction in their cholesterol levels as well as LDL compared to water, and these changes are most likely due to their the amount of weight loss and not necessarily due to the consumption of a diet beverage. And finally, what about adherence to calorie goals? And this is something that we did not measure or report in the study. Um, but remember, at the beginning of the study, we recruited people who already drink diet beverages. So those people that were randomized to a diet beverage group, they didn't have to make any significant changes in their beverage consumption behavior. Whereas the water group, they're used to drinking diet beverages and they were no longer allowed to consume those. So they had to make this change, which 
if they wanted to consume something sweet, they may have turned to something like a regular soda or a dessert, which may have made it harder for them to adhere to their calorie goals. Um, so in conclusion, despite the findings that previous observational research has shown, our results provide support for the use of non nutrient beverages in the context of a behavioral weight loss program. And we can confidently say that if you drink diet beverages and you continue to drink those, you can continue to drink the diet beverages without concern that your weight loss efforts will be undermined. And similar to the study I mentioned previously by Tate, the non nutritive sweetened beverages do not hinder weight loss. And interestingly, um, Tate conducted a follow-up study looking at caloric consumption behavior, and they showed no evidence that short-term consumption of diet beverages increases your preference for sweet food and beverages. They actually showed a, the opposite. So the diet beverage group showed a reduction in their consumption of regular sweetened beverages as well as their consumption of dessert. And our results are also consistent with evidence from the National Weight Control Registry. And um, Phelan showed a study that um, those who have lost weight and been able to maintain that weight loss, they use non-nutritive sweetened beverages as an effective tool to <coughs> keep that um, weight off. So our study is very significant because it was the first randomized clinical trial to compare water and non nutritive sweetened beverages in the context of a controlled weight loss program. And in research, a randomized clinical trial is considered the gold standard because you can control for a lot of things. Um, we also have highly valid outcome data, and because our study was multi-site, it gave us a very large, diverse sample size and sufficient <coughs> power to de detect a difference. So where would we like to go from here? And right now, like I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of the long-term follow-ups of this study. And there's a few questions that we would like to know or answer. Um, and it's interesting when you do research, a lot of times you conduct a study, you get some results, and then you get some answers. And a lot of the times, um, those answers kind of lead to more questions. So um, one thing we would like to look at is how do, does the consumption of non nutrient and beverages affect one's food intake and food selection? So this would be getting at different cravings. Um, and it'd also be interesting to see if we recruit people who don't normally consume diet beverages <coughs> and have them drink a diet beverage, what would the effect be of the, that consumption of diet beverages on their weight loss? Um, we'd also like to look at if there are differences in weight loss based on the type of non nutritive sweetener. So um, aspartame, stevia, and sucralose are just a few examples. And um, this concludes my talk, and I would like to give a special thanks to Carrie Brill for her support and management of the Colorado study team, as well as to Dr. Peters and Dr. Hill for their um, writing of the manuscript. And with that, are there any questions? Okay, I think you've gotten to the point where your results show that there's some arc here, not just science, because you can't explain the results. Right. <laughs> um, is satisfaction part of it that if you can, you know, take care of that sugar craving, the sweet craving that is, that maybe that satisfies people and they don't have to eat as much? Is that potentially the I mean, answer? That, that is potentially, um, that potentially could be an answer and that's something, again, we didn't report on, we don't know for sure what was going on, so I think that's something we would like to look at. Could there be a methodology to prove that or is it too art-like, um, too artful? <laughs> I don't know, Dr. Peters, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, part of what we're looking at is, I think, we have an inkling that this improves adherence. Adherence is the number one factor for weight loss. If you adhere to the program, you're gonna lose weight. If you don't adhere to the program, you don't lose enough weight. So we think there's something there, and maybe the sweet, the presence of sweet flavor with no calories can be a help to people to say, I can't live without sweet, but I don't want the consequence. So I think there are ways of approaching that question. It requires you know, more controlled, small type experiments um, you know, because that's, you know, to turn it from an art into the science, it, it's going to have to be a lot more, you know, non-free living. Yeah, Bob, <laughs> if you remember Sarit's study when she said their intake was 1,600 calories? Yes. That's totally implausible. Right. Okay? Right. So if we ask people what they eat, we get data that's totally implausible. What do you do with that? You know those people aren't eating 1,600 calories. So that's why if you really want to know the effect on food intake, 
you can't ask them. You've actually got to bring them in in a setting where you actually measure food intake, and that's a whole different ballgame. Absolutely can be done, but a really, really difficult, complex, expensive thing to do. And, and actually, Mark Cornier, who I believe gave you a talk yesterday, he does a lot of functional MRI studies, so to see which areas of the brain light up and move ingest certain types of foods. He's aware of this type of literature. And there are studies that have shown that with non-nutritive sweetener intake, there are certain areas associated with pleasure from intake of those for some people and not for others. So that could actually in part answer the question and maybe he would do a study here <laughs> later on to actually Are those the same parts of the brain that light up when you have sugar? Yeah. So it's so sweetness it's a, that... It's a response reward system. So in, this is not my area, it's his, but I just, I know some of his work and some of the things that he follows, so, yeah. Why is it controversial? Why is non nutritive beverages controversial in diet? Because a lot of people think that they cause you to gain weight. And um, there's uh, reports that people feel more hungry when they consume a diet beverage and that it's going to make them gain weight because they feel more hungry or that um, non-nutritive sweeteners can cause cravings, so it can cause you to crave more non-nutritive sweeteners and drink more or eat more sweet foods. Um, and that's why in previous studies have shown that, the observational studies have shown that an association between diet beverage consumption and weight gain. So <coughs> like I said before, we don't know what direction this asso association is going. We don't know if the beverages were causing the weight gain or if overweight people were more likely to choose a diet beverage. To me, there seems to be relevance for um, diabetics, especially with this, especially um, those who are obese <coughs> diabetic, because I know that's such a struggle for mm -hmm. people who are diabetic to have something sweet but not have something with sugar. So yeah. it seems like there's a lot of relevance for yeah, that this population. Yeah, this could definitely be an effective tool for those people struggling with diabetes. Other questions? Um, just a really quick question about those other observational studies mm -hmm. um, and what might have sort of what might have gone wrong or um, what that might uh, be reflecting. And you mentioned it just now that maybe people who um, are overweight would want to drink diet beverages. Yeah. Do you think you had yeah, I think right? too with um, behave consumption behavior. Um, if you know that you're choosing a diet beverage and there's not a lot of calories in that, you're like, oh great, then I can eat a lot more calories with something else because I'm not getting calories through my beverage. Um, so if some people mentally may be thinking that um, they can eat more just because they're consuming a diet beverage. But let me take that one on too because again, if you look, you see uh, non-nutrient sweetened drinkers, they tend to be more obese than the water drinkers. Now, what else is different about lean and obese people? What are the other behaviors that could explain those differences? You see what I'm saying? Is they could be, uh, we know obese people are less physically active, so those groups probably differ in physical activity. There are so many things they differ in, and that's why on an associational study, you don't know why two things are related. So bottled water consumption is associated with the rise in obesity very strongly correlated. Now, does that mean that bottled water consumption causes obesity? No. During the time obesity increased, bottled water increased, uh, so many other things changed. And that's why associational studies are great for giving you a good hypothesis to test. But to really know if two things are related, then you have to do a randomized control trial. Yeah, like Dr. Hill mentioned, a lot of those associational studies can't really control for other confounding factors, so like the physical activity, or um, your race and ethnicity, or where you live. And so with the randomized control trial, we can control for those things. So I think it says a lot more um, from a randomized control trial, the results. Um, Dr. Else? Hill, why do you think people have globbed on so much to the fact that Diet beverages could make you fat. Why do you think so, that that has become such a... So I'm glad you asked me that. So <laughs> when this study came out, uh, you know, talking to a lot of people in the press and so forth, it's like, oh my gosh, this, this is, you know, totally unexpected. I thought we knew they caused weight gain. Scientific community are saying, duh, we already knew this. Why are you, why are you getting so much press with a study that shows what we already knew anyway? Isn't that interesting that the scientific community basically says we've never bought that idea that these things cause weight gain. We see these associational studies, but we know that associational studies can't, cause, can't do cause and effect. 
uh, why do epidemiology studies really get the headlines? Because they make a sensational statement. Two things are related. It seems logical. People that don't understand a lot about how science is done say, well, this seems logical. And we are so <coughs> looking for simple causes of obesity. We're so looking for these things that we can blame it on that I think it's pretty easy to glob onto these kinds of ideas. And I know we've talked about this. It's, it's hard to get around the fact, most headlines that were critical, well, one was the length of study, but then also, which it sounds like you're fixing, or you're working on, mm -hmm. so you'll have more data, which is yep. great. But then the beverage uh, so, funding, right. and you can never really kind of get so, around so that. Perfect. That's the, the one thing we got a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, it's funded by American Beverage Association. So we, uh, non nutrient sweeteners have been around a long time, and nobody's done this study. So why would we criticize the Beverage <coughs> Association to do it? I would turn it around and say, if you're marketing these stuff and, you, and then they cause weight gain, you darn well need to know it. If you're responsible, you would take a look at your product. Now, I will tell you that the American Beverage Association, <coughs> I think, was pretty sure it was going to come out positive toward them because they make the product, they've looked at the product. So, so you know, in some ways it wasn't, oh, we're going to roll the dice. I think what they said is, these things are getting a bad rap. We don't think they do that. And so they did the kinds of studies that would show that. Now, was it a risk? Absolutely. It could have come out differently. And believe me, we would have published it had it come out differently. Hmm. Uh, but I think part of it is, should these, study, should these companies be doing this kind of research? And in my sense, they're irresponsible if they aren't doing this kind of research, if nobody else is doing it. How do you reconcile that, though, with the tobacco studies back in the day? I mean, which everybody has in their head. Yeah. Which okay. is why that whole funding stuff gets back up. So again, if you look at the tobacco studies, they were not done by reputable universities and scientists. If you look at it, they had these marginal kind of people. They did a lot of it themselves. What I would say is, if you go out and fund, and I would say that University of Colorado and Temple University, Gary Foster at Temple is one of the leading scientists in the obesity area. I think part of what these companies need to do is go after those scientists who have a reputation. I mean, I have 500 publications, probably five of them are industry funded, and you know, 495 are NIH funded, so nobody's gonna accuse me of making a career on industry funded studies. So part of it is finding good places. The other part is making the data available. We freely make the data from these studies available. It undergoes peer review. So the idea is if you see that it's funded by a company, fine. Give it extra scrutiny. I have no problem with that. I think that's totally fair. But then evaluate the science. You may evaluate it more rigorously than if you would it was funded by NIH. If you want to do that, fine. But take a look at the science and see what it says. It, is the NIH funding squeeze making you rely more on these uh, industry supported studies? Well, the NIH squeeze in general is making people rely. So I've had people that turn their nose up at industry funded studies for years and are coming to say, how do I get an industry funded study? That to me is not the right way to do it. I think there are certain things that industry should fund that NIH won't fund. So industry is not, you know, if I were the American Beverage Association, I wouldn't just say I'm open for business, I want to fund good science. I would fund science that's directly related to my project. Good science, but directly funded projects. So I think in general, more universities are looking at diversifying funding. As NIH funding goes down, all these scientists have to get more funding some way. And I think there's an opportunity to actually get more dollars. And I, I've actually been a big fan <coughs> of mixing industry and NIH funds. Wouldn't it have been great if the American Beverage Association had gone to NIH and said, together, let's pool funds and, and, and study these kinds of things. Mm -hmm.